If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Genesis chapter 11 this morning. Genesis chapter 11, we are in the eighth part of our series here on the defense rest, and we are finally past Noah and that flood, and uh, I... Uh, in our first service, we got out a little bit early, so uh, that should be a bit of a relief. I know we've been getting out late over the last couple of weeks, but my message is not particularly long this morning, but I pray that the Lord would use it in your life as we speak some powerful truths. But we want to talk this morning about the introduction of difference, the introduction of ethnicities, of culture, of language, the introduction of differences into mankind. And then we see it in Genesis chapter 11. One of the things that I love most about Scripture is its sufficiency. That is, that the Bible is the only work, so to speak, in uh, the history of humankind that has the power to transcend uh, every generation and to speak to every generation and during every season. I've noticed that in my own life. I've seen how the faithfulness of the Lord to speak through His Word when I was young, when I was Isaiah's age, when I was a teenager, when I'm getting older, when I'm getting up towards the top of that hill. And even as we get older, uh, I've got many faithful older folks in our congregation this morning. Uh, it's just amazing to me how the Bible has this ability to speak to us in every generation and through every season of life. And not just what we experience, but rather it speaks to every succeeding generation. It is amazing to me to turn on the news or to scroll through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever your, uh, your uh, preferred mode of social media, to be able to scroll through those and to see the happenings of society and to see how Scripture speaks to us in our time. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? God has not left us abandoned. He is here with us this morning. The Spirit of God indwells us to lead us in all righteousness. But not only that, but He's not silent. He gives us His revealed truth that could be written by a great many different authors, composed by a great many different authors, but being guided by the one Lord, uh, the one Spirit, so that His truth would reign true through all of the history of time, all the way uh, into eternity future. And that's one of the things I love most about Scripture. And this morning is really no different. As we turn to Genesis chapter 11, we're going to take up the topic of differences. And it really is a very uh, uh, timely message, a timely truth for what we are seeing in the world, just even in the last couple of weeks, but certainly in the last couple of months. We've been talking in this series about how we are trying to contend for our faith, not only with the skeptic to answer his questions, but also to contend for the faith in our own personal lives, to answer the difficult questions that arise in our own, uh, in our own minds, in our own hearts. But this morning, I want to take up one of the skeptic's questions, because one of the skeptic's questions is, if, if the Christian faith believes that God uh, originally created two people, Adam and Eve, and the whole human race came from them, and then then uh, we could take it a step further. Then God destroyed the human race, save Noah and his family. And so we are all descendants of them. Then where do we get all of these different races from? Where do we get all of these different cultures from? Where do we get all these different ethnicities from? Where do we get even all these different languages from? By the way, I would just add as, add as an aside, the skeptic uses that argument as an argument against the Christian faith by essentially saying the Bible can't possibly be true because if the Bible were true, we wouldn't have all of these differences in our present society. But the truth is that every worldview has to answer this same question. For example, if you believe that the world came into existence through the Big Bang Theory and that man came out of that through macroevolution and, and natural selection that we came out of that, you still have to answer the question of where difference came from. How did we get different? How did we have these multiple cultures and languages and ethnicity? How did we get to the point where we are today? And that point is often missed by the skeptic. They think that only religious people have a problem here. They think that, uh, that they do not, when in reality, every creationist view in some form 
form or fashion has to come to a point where they answer the question of how we got here and how we had these differences. I would actually argue to the skeptic that this is what sets the Christian worldview apart. This is what makes the Christian worldview so powerful, and that is that in the Bible we are actually given a coherent answer and an explanation as to why our differences exist, why we are different. But it's not only that the Bible gives us a historical view of why we are different in the world today, but it also goes deeper than that and goes beyond the historical record, and it gives us a theological explanation as to why we see the wars that we do in the world today, why we see the nations raging against one another, why we see groups of people hating against one another. I want to be abundantly clear, say this from the offset this morning or the onset this morning, difference does not necessitate hate. And if we don't understand that, then we have failed from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, of understanding what Scripture is teaching us about the history of mankind. The world today is on fire. Our, in our current climate, the two seem always synonymous, that if you are different from me, that means we cannot get along. We must uh, be against one another. But the Bible actually gives us not only a coherent historical perspective of how our differences came about, but it explains why we war against one another. It explains why it is that there is no peace across the globe today. Do you ever just stop and ask yourself, how did we get to this place? How did we get to a place in society where the nations rage, why there is so many wars in the Middle East, why there are wars within our own borders among people, groups? How did we get to a place where people cannot coexist amidst their differences? How did we ever get here? And I would posit to you this morning that only Scripture offers a coherent answer to that question, and it comes to us very early in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, is the record of how we came to where we are as a society with specific attention to our relationship through our differences. Our differences in language, our differences in skin color, our differences in culture, and so much more. Genesis 11, 1 through 9 is a coherent explanation as to how we got there. Now, before I dive into it, I'm just going to make three simple points this morning. But before we do that, I, want to, I do want to draw one uh, uh, distinction at the very beginning, and it is a linguistic one. You know, in our world today, we talk often, or we talk in terms of differences in race. We, te we talk about differences in racial components. But, you know, biblically speaking, the Bible does not teach a difference in race this morning, but rather the distinctions the Bible draws are of ethnicity, culture, and language. We hear that term race a lot in our society, specifically in reference to different skin color or characteristic or culture or feature. But biblically speaking, there are not many races, but there is one race, the human race. And the reason that is significant is because it already draws our attention to a great truth this morning, and that is this, that we are all created in the image of God. That all of us across the globe, every human life, is fashioned and formed for His glory. Can I get an amen on that? That we are all created in the image of God. And each life is worthy of that dignity, respect, honor, and hospitality. Because we were all formed and fashioned uniquely by God. But not only that, what's interesting is that both science and philosophy are finally catching up to this truth, up to this concept. In fact, we are now in our genetics classes talking about how there must have been a, a, a common ancestor in order for us to come here because of our understanding of DNA and genetics. Not only that, but in sociology circles, now they are saying things like race is a social construct. I am glad that they are finally catching up to what the Bible said 4,000 years ago, aren't you? Now what's interesting, and I want to be clear about, is that we don't agree with every new translation or never every new understanding, specifically in sociology terms, because some of them are very dangerous. 
And the one you've heard the most about because it's been in the nose uh, of late is uh, most notably critical race theory. Critical race theory or CRT posits that I am inherently racist this morning because of my birth, my upbringing, and my experience. In other words, critical race theory stands on a foundation that because I was born into a middle-income family, white family, heterosexual, Christian family, that I am a racist, I just don't know it. I want to be clear, we reject that this morning. In order to function in a peaceful society, critical race theory says that I have to divest my whiteness. And the outworking of that was in the news here recently when news broke that Coca-Cola was doing a training and used a video from the leading critical race theory proponent, a training video that told their employees to be less white. Beloved, that is not biblical truth. That is not the gospel. That is not where we need to have our understanding of our differences. But one good thing that has come out of all of this, one good thought that is starting to catch some steam, is, that the, re- is the reality that the term race is really a misnomer. I, for one, am glad that science, I'm glad that sociologists, I'm glad that philosophers are finally catching up to what God has said all along in his word. Because the Bible has taught for thousands of years that there are not races, there is one race, the human race. That truth is important, it is fundamental, it reminds us at the onset that we are all created in the image of God, but secondly, it reminds us that we are not as different as we like to pretend. That our differences are often driven and stressed, often brought to breaking points by more devious and sinister puppet masters. You are not as different as you believe from the person sitting to your right or to your left or the person that you see across the globe, even the person that you see on your TV screen. We are not all that different because we are all one race, the human race, form and fashioned in the image of God. Genesis chapter 11 offers to us a commentary on how we got here. I said, have you ever asked yourself the question, how in the world did we ever get here? Genesis 11 offers us an explanation. And not only does it offer us an explanation of how we got here, but it points us toward a solution of how we can be resolved to live in peace with our brothers and sisters. Three truths this morning and I'll be done. First, our differences in culture, tongue, creed, and location are, are a direct result of sin. Write that down, underline it, understand it this morning. It is important that we make this note. In other words, if you look back at God's original design, his original creation, he provided no need for different ethnicities. He provided no need for different cultures. He provided no need for different languages because in his good creation, man was one, right? Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 tell us about what changed. It tells us the story of what we know as the Tower of Babel. And quickly, let me recite it for you. We are told in verse number 1 that the whole earth was once inhabited with a people with a common language and tongue. Some say that the whole earth is gathered in this one location. I think that's a possible interpretation. I don't think you have to go to that interpretation. But for certain, verse 1 tells us that across the globe, everybody's spoke one tongue, one language. Now that is an important statement at the onset because it goes past language. Well, because of modern technology today and globalization, today in my neighborhood, there are five different countries that I know of that are represented right here in Sedalia, Missouri. And I think by last count, by survey, by the census, there were some 81 different ethnicities represented in just Sedalia, Missouri, and we are a rural community. But because of modern technology, because of advancement in education and learning, we don't oftentimes think of language in all of that important of context. But in fact, it is. In fact, language is the key to assimilation into any culture. For example, if you want proof of this, when Daniel and the Hebrew children were carried into exile by the Babylonians, what was the, one of the first things the Babylonians did? 
Sure, they gave them a new diet. They gave them new clothing. They even gave them a new name. They gave them a new education and understanding of how the world came into existence. But they did all of that. They based all of that on a first more foundational step. That was they changed their language. They made them speak their language. Why? The reason why was because in order to reframe their entire worldview, language would play a large part in that work. In other words, if you wanted to give them a new education first, you had to get them speaking your language. Language is personal. So when Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1 tells us that the whole world was speaking the same language, it is giving us a much more broader understanding, and that is that the world itself was in relative unity of, of mindset, that is, of relative sameness in culture and context. Mankind was very similar coming into Genesis chapter 11. And because they were so similar... Genesis chapter 11 verse 2 tells us that they began to migrate to a singular location. And then verses 3 and 4 tell us that they decide while they're there that they're going to build this massive city and this massive tower that reaches into the heavens. Specifically, they sought to build this tower so high that it would reach all the way into the heavens from which they followed with the statement, let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, God's response to that is found in verses 5 down to verse 7. In verse 5, he comes and he visits mankind, and what he sees troubles him. That's interesting to me. Verse 6 says that, behold, he said to them, behold, they are one people, and they have one, all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, speaking of the city and the tower. And nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. Verse 7, he then says, inside the Trinity, he says, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Then verse 8 and 9 gives us the title of the episode. He does exactly what he says he's going to do. The Lord comes down, he confuses their language so that they babbled, and the location became known as the Tower of Babel. Now, here's my question. In John's gospel, Jesus says that his prayer in the high priestly prayer is that you and I would be one as he and the Father are one. We know that God does not like division and strife and conflict. So what is, the, what is uh, wrong in Genesis chapter 11? The people are just gathering together. They're coming to one place and they're building this massive city. They might have even made the argument that we can do things better together. This is the first urban environment. They are moving away from rural communities into one singular large city. What is the problem with that? Because they're just becoming one, right? What is taking place that the Lord deems it necessary to separate mankind into different people groups, spread out across the globe, and to confuse their languages? What is the problem here? There are three primary answers to that question, which I find interesting. Uh, there are a lot of other answers, but these are the three that I find most interesting. I offer them to you this morning. First, some have suggested that the sin of the people in Genesis 11 is one of arrogance. You see, God had just flooded the earth, and this is the event that is told to us right before Genesis 11, correct? And so they say it is significant that the people decided they were going to build this tower and that this tower would reach up into the heavens. In other words, some say that the sin of the people in Genesis 11 is that they were essentially saying to God, you will not flood us out again. If you send rain, if you send water again, we will build a tower so high that it cannot flood us. The second possible sin that they are doing is, uh, is found in their gathering in a single location. Some say that the sin of the people is direct disobedience. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, God told Noah and his sons to be fruitful and to multiply. And then he tells them to spread out over the face of the earth, to fill the earth. So some say, Genesis 11, that the sin there is that the descendants of Noah are not doing what God said. They're not filling the earth, but rather they are coming into one location, which is a direct disobedient or a direct opposition to God's direct command of filling the earth. 
The third possibility for what is wrong in this moment in Genesis 11 is that some have suggested that the sin of Genesis 11 is one of oppositional challenge. They see in that phrase, verse 4, let us make a name for ourselves, a direct challenge to God. Almost as though the people were saying to God, you are not the show here, we are. We are the center of attention. We're going to build a city so large that our glory will be renowned among the nations. Now, if I had to choose this morning, I'd, I think I'd go with all three. I think all three are certainly possible and true. They all relay ultimately the same truth, and that is this, that man was living in Genesis 11 in defiance to his creator, which is a bit of a sad epitaph, because what it means is that through the first 11 chapters of Scripture, after the first fall, the same problem, the same sin, keeps reoccurring over and over and over again. Even Adam's sin was one of wanting to rule their own lives, wanting to not have a sovereign, not wanting not to have someone to answer to, wanting not to be submitted to someone, so wanting to control their own destinies. And that problem keeps coming up over and over again. And I can say with full authority this morning that, beloved, after 4,000 years, nothing much has really changed. All sin today is still us saying we are in charge of our own existence, right? I'm going to do things my way in the words of the great uh, song singer uh, Frank Sinatra, right? And, and half of you are not sure who that is, but you can Google him later. In 4,000 years, man's greatest desire is still to be his own God, to have no master, to serve nothing, no one greater than himself. By, that, well, by the way, that in this way joins Genesis 11 to the story of the flood. That God is going to one more time have to put guardrails on mankind again. Remember that as we came into the flood, God first put a limitation on the number of years man could live so that man could not just live for seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years and continue to propagate evil. Then he had to drown out part of the population, the majority of the population, to kind of, as it were, uh, 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 set things new for this new family as they were going to live and propagate and fill the earth. And now in Genesis 11, he's going to have to separate man by language and culture to to limit their ability to scheme for evil together. When you put it all together, then you're left with one undeniable conclusion. When God created the world in all of its sinless beauty, he designed mankind to be one. To be one in language, to be one in ethnicity, to be one in culture, to be one in people. But sin, as it always does, is destroying God's good creation. And as a part of that destruction, sin has now separated mankind. I want to be clear this morning, the separation of people here in Genesis 11 is actually a gracious act on the part of God upon his creation, which should cause us to ask some serious questions, serious ethical questions, but I'm not going to dive into that. I'm going to save it for a different hour. But none of that is necessary without the introduction of sin. Sin is the root cause of our differences. Did you know that? Our differences, their root cause is sin. That leads me to a second truth this morning. That it is so simple and so short that it seems even unnecessary to mention. But if God brought about these differences in mankind in Genesis 11, then that means that they should be celebrated and not hated. I said that differences do not necessitate hate. Here is why. It's okay for us to be different this morning. Did you know that? It is okay for you to, to, uh, to uh, like Brussels sprouts and for me to think you're lost and going to hell for doing so. It is okay for me to love chocolate chip cookies and you like oatmeal cookies. It is okay for us to be different. And somebody said, you know, that I knew that. When I married my spouse, I knew that it was okay. In fact, it is better than okay for us to have differences. It is a part of God's beautiful design. We could talk about our similarities, and I think that speaks to our common race. You know, I've had the privilege over the years in ministry to travel to India, Africa, Mexico, multiple countries, multiple times. And you know what I've been amazed at each and every time? That we are not very different. Sure, they speak a different language. They look a little bit different than I look, and I'm sure that I look different to them. They have a different sense of humor about certain things than I do, and I have a different sense of humor 
But here's what I find. We struggle with the same problems. We share the same concerns. We fear the same things. And we find beauty in the same sources. That speaks to our commonality that we are all one human race. We are not as different as we pretend. But where there are differences, Genesis 11 is showing us that it is okay to celebrate those differences. <laughs> Can I get a witness about that this morning? It is okay to celebrate our differences. It's right to do so, right? Because God made them a part of his masterful plan. Modern sociologists and proponents of CRT say that I have to stop being me this morning. They say that being me is the real problem. That I have a thousand inherent biases that cause problems for you that I don't even know about today. That I'm a racist not because I do racist things, but I'm a racist because that's just who I am. They say that our problem is uniformity. Everybody needs to be the same. And if we could get everybody to be the same, then we would solve all of our divides. And beloved, the result of such illogic is unending. Because it's not just enough to suggest that the culture becomes a problem. Now it becomes a problem of any difference. In other words, anywhere we're different, that becomes a problem. That becomes a place of warring. That becomes a place of disagreement. And so when you get to the end of it, Mr. Potato Head can't be a mister anymore because by being a mister, he is naturally oppressive to Mrs. Potato Head. And I didn't even know they were genders when I got them as a child, right? Instead of embracing the way that God made me, seeing the intrinsic value in that, Instead of embracing the way God made you and seeing the intrinsic value in that, now modern sociology says, no, I have to all be uniform. And then it becomes no surprise to us that we move into gender issues and the list goes on and on and on because if I don't match, that means that there's something wrong with either me or with you. Beloved, I ask the question in all sincerity, where does it end? It is utter foolishness. It is utter folly. Genesis 11 shows us that God has purpose in our differences this morning. That God has purpose in our uniqueness. That God has purpose in our differences. But most importantly, third and finally this morning, Genesis 11 points us forward to a better day. I want to show that now. I said that the introduction of new languages in Genesis 11, which would ultimately lead to man spreading out across the globe and the development of different cultures, was a result of sin. I then said that our differences were a part of, of God's good design. But if I go back to that first point, that our differences are ultimately the result of sin, then we believe that God is in the process of transforming this lowly sinful estate. That means that God's future will include what? A re reunification of the peoples, right? Turn with me quickly to Acts chapter 2. It's an important text on this matter. Jesus has ascended into heaven after his resurrection, and he has left his disciples with a job to do. And you know what that job is, right? He told them to go and to make disciples, right? To baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he tells them to start in Jerusalem and go to Judea, Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus tells these disciples, these first followers, that they are to go and make disciples of every nation. Now that points us towards what is about to happen. He tells them to wait until the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then we come to Acts chapter 2, and we have this marvelous day of Pentecost. And here, lo and behold, the Holy Spirit shows up on the scenes, right? And he, he, and he comes upon the scenes to move upon the disciples to accomplish, to empower them to do what Jesus has told them to do. Verse 5 says, sets the context, that they were there gathered in Jerusalem, Jews, now listen to this, devout men from every nation under heaven. Er, stop there. The Roman way in Roman culture was to spread people out and fill them throughout the Roman Empire so that they would be overwhelmed with Roman culture and philosophy. In other words, a conquered people would be divided and taken over into other parts of the Roman Empire so that they could learn what it meant 
to be a Roman, including to speak the right language, right? And this is, no, this is also true of the Jewish people. As, the Jew, as Jerusalem is conquered, the people are spread out, but also people from other parts of the Roman Empire are brought in. And Acts chapter 2, verse number 5 tells us that indeed on this day, the day of Pentecost, the Jews are gathered there together, right? And while they're gathered, there are these people who have found the Jew, Jewish view uh, to be uh, something that they're interested in. They are devout. They are seeking the Lord. But they come from every different nation under heaven. They're gathered together in one place, making Jerusalem a perfect launching pad into the gospel proclamation across the globe. And the Holy Spirit comes down upon these disciples. Verse number six, they began to speak, to proclaim the gospel. And listen, everybody hears it in their own language. It is a powerful moment. Why? Because God was restoring what had been lost in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, mankind had been separated by tongue. And now, in Acts chapter 2, for the proclamation of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit, man was being brought back together one more time, being reunified. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 speaks to this same truth as the elders come before the lamb and they see how he's been slain on behalf of the people and they sang a new song and they said, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransom, listen to this, you ransom people for God from every tribe, every language and every people and every nation. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, there was a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, which had been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. What, what, beloved, what is the point? The point is that sin had separated us. Genesis 11 tells us that story. But now as we move into the New Testament, Jesus is reconciling mankind to himself and to each other. Let me make it crystal clear. The solution to racism is not for me to divest my whiteness any more than it is for a black man to divest his blackness. The solution to racism, the solution to white supremacy, the solution to every form of division is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way mankind will ever be united back together again is through the proclamation of Jesus Christ who makes us one in him. Only Jesus can bring us back together. Only Jesus can reunite what has been divided. And to that end, beloved, the church alone has the answer to societal ills. Did you know that? Only the church can bring harmony to a warring world. Only the church can bring the hope of transformation because only the church has been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we adopt the vain philosophies of the world and we abandon the clear proclamations of Scripture, listen, we aren't solving the problem. We are making it worse. Because only the gospel. Church, we have a role to play in bringing peace to this world of division. We have a role to play. And that role to play is not to be political pundits. The role that we play is not to, to uh, bash CNN or to bash Fox News. The role that we play is not in stoking more hatred, more violence, more harm. The role we play is the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth until the end of time. If the church would get about its business of proclaiming Jesus Christ, him crucified, his finished work on the cross of Calvary, on the behalf of sinners, mankind will be sooner united. Because it is only through the gospel. Beloved, one of the most disappointing parts of being a Southern Baptist, and I am very proud to be a Southern Baptist this morning, one of the disappointing moments of Southern Baptist life came in 2019 at our annual meeting in Birmingham when we passed a resolution. For those unfamiliar, resolutions in Southern Baptist life are not legally binding. They have nothing over the local church. In other words, a resolution doesn't affect us here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Resolutions are passed 
passed at the annual convention as a way of staying to the world, here's where we stand on particularly hot button cultural issues, okay? And that's why since the 1980s, Southern Baptists have every year passed resolutions about our view of the sanctity of human life and pursuing legislation that would protect the unborn. But in 2019, we passed a resolution infamously known as Resolution 9, which while it claimed to hold scripture as the ultimate authority, affirmed the use of critical race theory in our churches. I have never been so disappointed in all my life. The reality is people did not even know what they were voting on because Tucker Carlson had not yet done his segment on critical race theory, right? People had no idea what it was they were voting on. Man after man of God stood up and begged folks not to do this because when the church begins to adopt vain philosophies to solve the world's problems and stops proclaiming the gospel, church, we might as well shut the whole thing down. We might as well lock the doors, walk out, and and mind our own business because it is only through the power of the gospel that mankind can ever be reunited together again. It is only through the proclamation of Jesus Christ slain on our behalf that unites the human race into harmony. So that when one day we arrive on those golden shores, we will be delighted on that day to find Mankind of every tribe, nation, and tongue united under one banner, one Lord, and one Savior. Beloved, we must not, we must not cede this ground. Genesis 11 gives us a simple answer as to how we got here and points us forward to what the solution to our societal ills are. Beloved, the problem is sin and the solution is Jesus Christ. If we want to stop the warring, if we want to stop the division, if we want to stop the hate, we've got to be less concerned with political uh, punditry and more concerned with the proclamation of Jesus from now to the ends of the earth to the end of the time. Would you join me in that mission? We can't do it. We can't do it, quote unquote, as a corporate entity. We'll never be able to do it. It will take individual resolve that you, you in your own personal life, within your own sphere of influence, will set out about the course of proclaiming the gospel. If you do that, if I do my part, if we all do that, listen, mankind will be reunited as they are united in the person and work of Jesus Christ.